started with conversion, and then we went to evangelization. And so it seems like we're done, right? This is on evangelization, so it's time to go home. <clears throat> but actually, the most important talk is this talk. Evangelization, as important as it is and necessary and a requirement of a good and faithful servant, and we will all be judged on how well we shared Christ with another, if we don't become holy, it doesn't matter that we were evangelizers for our own soul. So the thing is, we can lead other people to Christ. The scary thing is, they could find their way to heaven and we not. Because we have free will. And it's a long life. And what we do from here to the end of our life matters. We don't believe in once saved, always saved. That would deny free will as a truth. So this third talk is sanctification. And to the evangelizer, it is the most important talk. Because how tragic would it be that you gave your life to sharing the gospel only to fall short in the end and be disqualified? That's a real downer. <laughs> Welcome back from lunch. <laughs> but those aren't my words. I'm just paraphrasing. See if you can guess who said this. No. I drive my body and train it for fear that having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. If St. Paul wrote those words and felt that way, I need to be trembling a little bit in my shoes up here. If St. Paul felt it was important enough to pen those words in his first letter to the Corinthians. So this is the church at Corinth. He was writing. Then we as evangelizers who are no St. Paul, but trying to be like St. Paul, we need to listen to those words. It is the addendum to grace and mercy that we know is Christ. But it gives us free will. It is not enough to be inspired to evangelize. A cheerleader can inspire. It is not enough to go out and share the gospel, even though it is a mandate we are called to do. Woe to me if I help another make it to eternity with God, but I do not. I can't think of any greater tragedy. Now, I have a mom who, I think she fixated on every tragic story she'd ever heard so that then she could use it as an object lesson for her children to not make the same mistakes. Don't go out on the ice too soon, you might fall through and drown. I mean, seriously, she, she knew all of the stories. Be careful if you're using the water hose. If it happens to hit the outlet, you're going to die. But we do need to listen to our mother. This is important stuff. I take this seriously. This is one of the most sobering topics for me to ponder, and I tend to ponder things. It's kind of what I do. I spend my days getting inspired and trying to inspire other people to love Jesus Christ so much that they want to share him. But one of the hardest things about becoming Catholic is I can't say, do you know where you will go if you die tonight? How many of you heard that from Protestants? And if you don't know where you're gonna go if you die tonight, then you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Again, that denies that we have free will. 
Because does that mean in 30 years when I die, if that's when I die, that what I said today carried that much weight? And I can live and do whatever I want between now and then? No. We need to be vigilant. We need to be vigilant because we are called to holiness. Now it's important that this talk comes after the talk on being evangelizers. Because do not fall under the illusion that you must first be a saint to be an evangelizer. Because we would have no, Mary would have been the only one. And she calls us to follow in her footsteps knowing that we are wayward children. But we are not to say, woo, I'm an evangelizer, that's gonna get me in. Because what gets us in is to become holy as he is holy. Not that I brought someone else to the Eucharist. Now, we will be judged on whether or not we took that opportunity when it presented itself, whether we were open to all of these gifts and we actually utilized them. But only the righteous will see God. And we must become holy as he is holy. When I wrote the book, I didn't think about this part. It wasn't until later. And it struck me that vacations are wonderful. That the ride home, not so much. Especially if there's a lot of stuff that you needed to escape from for a little while and you're going back to it and you've got to hit it all again. I can't imagine that journey. I can't imagine the journey to Mount Karen from Nazareth, having been there a number of times. But this one, I really can't wrap my brain around. She's just been with Elizabeth, who has been a pure joy to be around. They've had a phenomenal time, and they have worked new life into the world. Elizabeth has loved her, embraced her, and Mary has as well with Elizabeth. She has served her and met her physical needs, and I'm sure there were many. And they have had a bonding like only women can know, especially a bonding over childbirth. There's no bonding like it. And it's a bonding between the generations, which is also very special. And now, Mary knows, I can't stay here. This is not my calling to stay in this wonderful, beautiful embrace that is Elizabeth. I must go back home to Nazareth and do what waits for me there. And so it is with our sanctification. I've come to realize that evangelization for me is so much fun. I hope you all either know it or come to know it as that as well. But sanctification is the journey back home. And it's not easy. It'd be nice if I could have put a period on this on my way back home. And I could know that this is what it will be. From here to the end, I got this, God. But I've come to realize after being Catholic this long, 2005 to 2017, that's 12 years, almost 12 years, 12 years this August, that it is hard. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it's getting harder. And I think the reason it's getting harder is because I'm going deeper. I've discovered the beauty of confession paired with spiritual direction. And if you have not yet asked your confessor if he would also be your spiritual director, you need to do that. Sure, you can go into the confessional and you can be behind a screen and you can remain completely anonymous and your sins are forgiven because it's Christ who's forgiving them through the 
words of the priest. But I encourage you to be willing to lift that veil. I encourage you to be willing to approach your priest and say, I really need a spiritual director. I don't know if you're available. I don't know if you have enough time. But would you do it or would you recommend someone who can do that for me? Because I want to go deep. And it's hard. You uncover things about you you did not know were there. Start going to confession more frequently. Not because you're a worse sinner, but because there's sin you don't even see you got. This is the hard journey. Ooh, be a cheerleader. For me, that's easy. So easy. But like Mary, we must not only turn towards Jesus and receive him, we must not only invite him into our home, our life, like Elizabeth did, but we must be willing to give up everything for him, to bear all for him, and to leave all behind for him. It's time for us to head back to Nazareth. This is not easy, for we live in a country that does not believe in picking up crosses unless there's something in it for us. We avoid sorrow. We avoid suffering. We hedge our bets. We minimize every loss, and we avoid hurt. We turn away from sacrifice, and we resent any offense. Wow, get on Facebook if you don't believe that one. <laughs> Mary was holy from the moment of her immaculate conception. She embraced sacrifice, sorrow, suffering, libation, which is a pouring out of yourself, oblation, which is like a burning and being consumed by fire, a burning up of yourself, from day one. We need baptism and confession for this. We need Lent. And I know it's not Lent, and we tend to do the liturgical calendar where that is neatly put away in a nice box, but guess what? The way of the cross, the Via Dolorosa, it's daily. It does not just come six weeks a year. You know it, because you know you have had suffering and sorrow in the middle of August. We need the inspiration. Wow, Bob was right way back when I was a junior in high school. We need the inspiration of the saints. We need to know them. Sanctification requires everything you got. It's not just the beginning step of an inward conversion. It's not just the outward gift of evangelization. It is the all-consuming fire of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that finishes the work of perfecting us with our yes to that sanctification. Within Elizabeth, we see John the Baptist. Let's look at that, because we're focusing on the visitation, but there were four there. Well, five. You count Zechariah. But we're going to look at St. John the Baptist who gave all. If, you ever, if you're ever able to go to the Holy Land, one of the places you might go, not everybody goes here, is Qumran. And I suggest you do go to Qumran because Qumran is believed to be possibly where St. John the Baptist was before he went into the wilderness and uh, came back uh, at telling people to repent. Behold the Lamb of God, baptize him. This is a picture on the left of a ritual bath called a mikvah. A mikvah is part of Jewish uh, faith tradition. It's a ritual uh, bathing, purification. And we can see how some of those seeds of John's baptism, the bapt baptism of repentance that he called us to, Probably the seeds of that started here. The picture on the right is also Qumran. It's just a picture looking out over the Dead Sea. This is, um, this is the area that John the Baptist would have known. And then the other side of the Dead Sea is Jordan. 
And he probably, because if you go further north, it's the Jordan River. So the Jordan River feeds into the Dead Sea and it goes nowhere else, which is why it's called the Dead Sea and it becomes like nothing can live there because it's so salty. So if you go further north, um, it is believed that John the Baptist would cross the Jordan River there, um, that Jesus probably was baptized on the other side of the Jordan River, um, on the Jordan side, Jordanian side, which doesn't, I mean, it sounds like that's a really, really far away, but the Jordan River at the place where he was baptized was probably as wide as from that wall to the little table. Not very wide. In fact, if you're standing on the Israeli side of the site where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, there's a, you call them boys, the things that float, going down the middle and you can't cross over because if you cross over, you're in Jordan and they don't like each other a whole lot, so you can't really do that. So you can go down in the water and um, put your feet in the water and you can renew your baptismal promises. You can, I've been in Jordan on the Jordanian side at that very same point, and you can do the same thing. You can go in, and, and there are baptisms that take place there. Um, but you're not supposed to talk to each other over, this is so sad. You're not supposed to talk to each other from the sides. We Christians are like, hi! And the Jordanians are like, don't do that. And the Israelis are like, But we as Christians, we're like, no, this, this is where we have the universal call to baptism. It's in our heart to want to be one with the people on the other side. John the Baptist called us to repentance. This one within Mary gave everything. It is a sobering talk. He laid down his life for his Lord. On the Jordanian side, and the Kara, I can't say this word right, Macaris. Now, Herod had three fortresses. And um, there's one in Israel that you can still go to, Masada. And Masada is fabulous. Now, Masada, there's nothing in Masada that's really what I would consider like Christian as far as a holy site. So if you, you travel, you may not go to Masada. But every time I'm on the set, I think of the Psalms because it's really high up. And I think of the high places that you hear about in the Psalms. Herod had another fortress that's been lost to time. We don't know where it is. And then he had this one, which is in Jordan, across the Jordan, across the Jordan River. And it doesn't look like it's a, a fortress on a hill because you're looking at the side of the hill. John the Baptist sends word to Jesus He's facing this really dark hour. This is the moment of truth. He has evangelized. He has shared the good news of Jesus Christ. He has called people to repentance. My priest has a very special devotion to John the Baptist because it's very much like a priest. But John the Baptist in this moment sends word to Jesus, are you the one? Are we to look for another? And Jesus sends word back, tell John, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see. Subtitle, yes, John, I am the one. And that's all John needed to know. Okay. I'm laying all of it down for you. All of it. John called us to repentance, but Jesus calls us to pick up our cross in this life and walk with him. So to live with him in the next. I don't know if you looked at today's gospel reading. Maybe you've already been to Mass. It's from John 17, where Jesus said that the hour has come for you to glorify the Son, that I may glorify you. That's Pentecost power, and that's what we're called to do. But he wasn't talking about, because I'm going out to the crowds, I'm going out on the Mount of Beatitudes, is where I'm going out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee to preach to them because it's wonderful acoustics and then when I preach from there it comes up and everybody can hear it. No, he says these words on the night before he is crucified. 
What is it to glorify God ultimately? To allow yourself to pick up your cross to the point of dying with Christ. Reflection time. This is where it gets really serious. This is not about, oh, do I have the nerve to evangelize? This is what holds me back from giving absolutely everything, being willing to walk away from everything. Is it conversion that I still need? Do I need to be made ready for evangelizing? Or is God saying, you've done that pretty well. I'm now calling you to take it deeper and to become holy as you can possibly be, holier than you can imagine, to be as holy as I am. Don't accept less than that, because remember, only the righteous will see God. With St. Paul, are you saying, woe to me if I share the good news of the gospel and I am found unworthy? Elizabeth gave a yes to a baby she was unlikely to see grow up. I tried to look, where where is she buried? When did she die? Some places say she died shortly after the death of the, the holy innocents. I mean, she didn't see him out of infancy. I don't know if that's right, but I know that it's, you didn't see her anywhere when John is, is going about calling people to repentance. And John did the same thing. He accepted a mission that would extend beyond his life. And Mary? Mary was at the visitation, but this is the same Mary that we see at the crucifixion, still giving all. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, if you don't know what that is, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre contains the holiest sites to us as Catholics. Within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you have the site of the crucifixion on Calvary, Golgotha. You have the anointing stone where our Lord was anointed. And then you have the tomb. This place within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre does not have a big sign on it. And there are people who pass through there who do not know what it is. And unless someone tells you when you're there, you don't know what it is. I was in Israel in November 2014. This was my second time to go. And I was with a group that was on pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage leader knew that I had this great devotion to the Holy Land and to making the connections of what we read in sacred scripture with the places where these things actually occur. And she said, Janice, I want to show you something that not everybody knows it's there because there's not a big sign on it. So after we'd been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we went back to the hotel. Everybody else went to take a rest or a nap. And Cece took me back. And we went in. And we walked in. There's a door behind these steps that's the entrance. And then you go up steps to this site right here, which is where our Lord died. And then we walked over here, and that's the tomb. You've probably seen images of it in, in the papers recently because it was renovated quite recently. <coughs> And there's a bench right here. And she said, Denise, come sit with me over here on this bench. So we sat there. And she said, look through the columns. What do you see? And I said, you see where our Lord died. And she said, this burning oil lamp is where, according to tradition, Mary stood. It had a direct line of view to her son. And most people miss it. This is where Mary stood and watched her son die for us. Mary was the only one left standing at the cross, but that too was the ultimate giving of everything that she had to give. A mother experiencing the greatest of all sorrows, greater sorrow than her own death would be to her. Mary at the visitation is the same Mary that we see at the crucifixion, giving absolutely everything and not fleeing, not saying, no, I can't do this. Saying, I will be here. I will do this. I will finish this. I will stay with you. You are my mission. At baptism, 
We died with Christ. We died with the one who was condemned to die. You made baptismal promises to walk through your entire life with him. And now it's time to look at those stations. Are you still walking the way of the cross with him? When he was condemned to death, Mary felt that. When he was given a cross to carry, she felt the weight of it. When he fell the first time, the second time, the final time, her heart fell within her and was crushed. When their eyes met, she ached to be with him as only a mother can and to take her son back in her arms again. When another one carried his cross, she was grateful for that one, but she wished that there was something that she could do to lessen his burden. When Veronica wiped his face, she thought of the many times she had done this or picked him up, saying to him, did all those things in the quiet moments of motherhood, things that nobody sees, nobody remembers, but in this moment, it was all flashing before her. I have this picture in here because this one reminds me of the grieving women in Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but I think about this moment when Mary saw the grieving women of Jerusalem because I know what I would have said. This is just a cultural thing for you. You are grieving because you're paid grievers. You don't even know my son. This is my son. This is my grief. This is my child. Why are you making this about you? But that's not what Mary does. Thankfully, she's not me. Mary invites them to grieve. And it is sort of prophetic. It is a prefigurement, if you will, of the fact that the whole world will know this day. And there will be people going and grieving and praying who do get it, who do understand it. There will be people who will realize this is not a cultural display, who will pass through these streets not to purchase the wares in the stores, but to be able to go at each station of the cross and genuflect with their heavy backpacks on their backs, carrying crosses through the streets, all wearing the same pilgrimage signs because they're together, praying and weeping and grieving and holding and hugging one another, knowing that the last station of the cross is waiting for them, and that's the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When he was stripped of his clothes, her heart was laid bare. When he was crucified, she stood firm. I think, you know, what if one of my kids had been in, in a hospital room dying? And I was in a hospital room when my granddaughter was having seizures. She was born with no life signs at all. And, they, and she was actually without a heartbeat for 12 minutes. Um, no, heartbeat, 9 minutes, without... Um, breathing 12. So she was without heartbeat 9 minutes and, and not breathing 12 minutes. And they thought she would have brain damage. They, in fact, they were convinced she would have either mild to moderate brain damage. She actually has none. That's a long story that is not in my notes, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I remember being in the room with my son and my daughter-in-law when she was having her seizures. And she's needing to step out of the room. We didn't know if she was going to make it. We didn't know what any of this meant. She looked perfect. She was nine pounds, nine ounces. The reason she had all these issues is because she was so big, and my daughter-in-law is 110 pounds when she's not pregnant. And um, Eliana was stuck when she was born. That was horrible, seeing that. But what Mary had to see, and her feet remained planted there, she didn't walk out. She didn't turn and have to have some time alone. 
When he died and was taken from the cross, she held him. When he was placed in the tomb, she sobbed and touched the stone that now separated them. She was then taken away into the darkness because it was the Sabbath and she couldn't stay there. I imagine these 24 hours, what was going through her mind, 24 to 48 hours. While everybody else is celebrating Sabbath, she's in deep sorrow. She's remembering his life. She's remembering the Annunciation and the Visitation. and She's remembering the Nativity. She's remembering him preaching. She's remembering the wedding at Cana when basically she was one who said, okay, I'm ready for your public ministry. Do whatever he tells you to do. And here she is. Her son is gone. Joseph is gone. Her parents are gone. Elizabeth is long gone. John the Baptist is gone. The apostles have scattered. And only a few women and one apostle move quietly in and around her. The way of the cross is the path to sanctification for us, and we must follow in her footsteps, not just at the joy of the Annunciation and the joy of the Visitation, but we must follow in her footsteps to our sanctification. What does this have to do with the Visitation, the joyful mysteries we call to mind, especially tomorrow on the Feast of the Visitation? How is the Visitation anything like the Sorrowful Mysteries? This is it. Write this down. It will be on the test. <laughs> because sanctification is marked by a divine visitation. God shows up. It doesn't end with the 14th station of the cross. Even though that's usually where we stop at Lent. What is the 15th station of the cross? I can hear the S's. <laughs> Resurrection. Yeah. God has come to us. We have shared Him. And now we fly to Him and leave ourselves behind for sanctification for the ultimate divine visitation. It was always about this. All of it. We don't bring others to conversion through evangelization just to all just talk about it. It's about becoming holy and, Lord willing, and in his mercy being together forever. When we are taken into the divine embrace, when we leave everything behind, when we, God willing, are considered worthy of the calling that we received. It is the same with Mass. God visits us in Mass. He calls to us. That's our altar call. The real one. And then he sends us. But it also is about the ultimate call to abandon everything when we receive the ultimate visitation. The final station of the cross, the 15th station, was the resurrection, and for us, it's our redemption. They're connected. So, say yes to conversion if that's where you are, and that's what you need. Say yes to evangelization because that is the mandate. That is the great commission. But whatever you do, say yes to your personal sanctification. For if you preach the gospel, it would be the greatest of tragedies to be disqualified in the end. And if St. Paul was worried about it, we should be concerned about it too.